Hey guys, Brian from Every Care Tiles here, and today we're gonna get technical down to the business. So we're gonna be talking about the scaleless project. I'm basically gonna be taking all the scaleless project like myths, and we're gonna go through all of our experience and be able to tell you guys so that you you guys are able to basically have your own idea and make your own opinion on whether or not you want to get into the scaleless project. So the first myth is basically that scaleless times scaleless. So if you read a scaleless male with a scaleless female, so two visuals together, that you will not get success. Well, the first thing that I can tell you that is that it's total bull crap, right? So the reason why is because we have done it. We have had a ton of success from reading scaleless to scaleless. Now, perfect, perfect clutches, like to the point that we even had some other clutches that we had just normal scaled animals with a normal scaled animals and we had full of slugs. So we haven't noticed anything different from breeding regular corn snakes to breeding scaleless corn snakes. Now, that basically made me think, you know what, I have to start learning and understanding the project itself to the point that why is it that people question this project? Now, one thing that I did learn was basically one of my buddy, Scott, from uh, that I met in Daytona, that he was from Florida, he breeds a lot of king snakes. Now, he came up with something that he mentioned to me that he basically uses sheds from males and adds them to water bowls so that he sprays his snakes when breeding season. What? This makes total nonsense, but it's because of pheromones. So pheromones is basically the whole thing that eliminated like my idea to the point that, you know what, maybe this is what is happening. So from all the questions that we have, do scales times scales work? They do work, but there's a lot more implicated into that project where pheromones are definitely implicated. Now, females basically, give out pheromones during the breeding seasons and the males will smell them and be attracted to basically be copulating females. So for breeders like us that have hundreds of animals, we can definitely notice the difference. Basically the whole room smells like sex, right? So when the whole room smells like sex, all the males are basically super interested. And you take a male, you insert him with the female, and then it takes minutes and the copulations are happening. Like take apart but at the beginning of the season and at the end of the season where there's less pheromones in the air um, the males a lot of males are less receptive now you have some studs you have some studs that you take the male in you add him to a female and he breathes and copulates anything that moves but you have no not, <laughs> not at all but like this guy that's behind the camera more <laughs> but anyway so guys you basically have those males that do really, really well, that you insert in with a female, they copulate, they do real, they, you, you get good success out of them. But you have some that are like a little bit more of the shy type that don't necessarily do, be doing anything. So sometimes you have to leave them extra. You gotta find a way to stimulate those animals. Now, how do pheromones work? Again, guys, this is not, I'm not talking to you guys about scientific discoveries or scientific papers. It's not me, right? I'm just talking to you guys about my opinion, my experience. So if you guys wanna teach me something, feel free to comment down below this video. But before you do so, make sure that if you wanna hate and you wanna tell me how wrong I am, make sure you subscribe on my channel. So you can hate make, on every so video. you can hate on every video, please do. So anyway, so just make sure, comment below. We're all working together. We're all trying to learn things here. But what I'm talking to you guys is my experience. Now my experience is different from everybody else's experience because I work on a bigger scale. Now, my whole experience has always been on mass production. Mass production, I don't produce tens of thousands, but I produce a few thousand a year, right? So when I breed animals, I always make sure that I, I never calculate the success rate of like every pairing. I calculate the success rate of my whole room and my investment based on the whole room and not on every little project. So there are definitely projects that have more success and other ones that don't. Now, pheromones, okay, like the females will basically, uh, can be can be smelled through their shit or through their scales. When they shed, they have a liquid that basically sips out through the scales and then it helps 
shed out the skin so it hydrates the new skin. Now, from that point on, that liquid still has a smell. So it seems that animals with scales have more pheromones. I've noticed that it works a lot better when you breed a scaleless male with a het scaleless female. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't work when you're breeding scaleless to scaleless. It just means that there's a little bit more work. It seems that they, they maybe like dry out a little bit faster or they don't smell as much. I mean, they do shed normally, they, they do act the same way, but it seems that without the scales, the, the males seem to be a little bit less interested. It's more towards a female, but when it comes, if you just wait it out a little bit, and when it comes to a, the middle of the season, everything breeds, everything. So I mean, never give up and do what you gotta do. Now, I'm gonna take, for example, here. <clears throat> so here I have a scaleless annery motley corn snake. Now this animal is from 2019. So it's only, it's only gonna be three years old. So this is gonna be its first year breeding. Now, when I'm gonna be inserting him with <clears throat> females, now there's a lot of things that I'm, I'm looking into. I'm looking at size. So sometimes a smaller male might not necessarily be interested into a bigger female. Why? Maybe the bigger female is just dominating the male. It's not letting him breed at this point. Some others don't have that problem. So it's just a lot of different questions that you have to ask yourself to see, but don't give up because the truth is it, they do work. Now, have I had bad experiences with scaleless to scaleless? I have, but it's more from lineage. So for example, my original lineage of scaleless when it came to snows, so just the snow morph, had very, very bad genetics. So <clears throat> every time I would be in my, breed my snows, I would get slugs and infer like infertile eggs, and they would never really do well. Now, what I told myself is that whenever I have a project that really doesn't work, I try to outbreed them as much as I can. So I basically took my best project when it came to fertility and health and quality, which were my tesseras, which we've already had videos. So if you haven't seen it, scroll down our videos and you can see a bunch of our videos that we have done about them. But I mean, uh, our tessera corns are definitely good. So by outbreeding them, we started getting success. It wasn't perfect success most of the time. We most of the time had like some, uh, maybe like half clutches, so half good eggs, half bad eggs, but we ended up getting babies from females that had never proven before. Now those females weren't necessarily scaleless females, but they were also even het. So it was more about like our lineage of snows with the scaleless that weren't necessarily doing good. If I take, for example, some of my oak descaleless, I've bred oak descaleless, visual to visual for years and years and years and I've never had a slug never had an infertility so there's a lot of different things that we have to look into now that brings me up into people that breed scaleless ball pythons right so the scaleless ball python seems to be losing traction a little bit right now because we're not seeing the result now my scaleless corns were basically first produced in the late 90s by reptilis in France and I mean I first got into that project in early like probably around 2010 so 10 years after the project first started so when did the scaleless ball python project first started like when that tell me? 10 years ago so about probably it. about 10 years ago so the only difference between ball pythons and scaleless corns is that scale corns corns breed like three times are like three times more proactive or breed more than ball pythons like i mean they'll breed every year they'll give you multiple clutches and i mean i say three times but i mean what is it? it's probably even more than that at this point you know so i mean uh for people that are into the scales ball pythons i definitely believe that in 20 years or so we're going to be seeing scales ball pythons be regularly bred it's just you can't give up we just got to keep at it and do what we got to do you know so and we have some scaleless balls probably this year we're we definitely have, going to be working on it we have this some scaleless head to scaleless head two clutches which is going to be pretty we don't have the clutches now 
No, we don't have the clutches now, but the females are building, so that's yeah, good. Yeah, definitely. So it's definitely, I love scaleless animals. And I mean, people say, well, why do we love them so much? Why do I basically spend so much time with these animals and try to do it? Well, one, because they just fascinate me. They fascinate me from the anatomy side, basically their, their coloration, the way that they behave, the way that they look on how they have scales on the belly, how the, the pattern looks different on the skin than on the scales. But what I love so much about them is actually the educational part of it. So the educational part of it is that there's so many people that we, the reptile industry is a very small and niche market. We're always there trying to explain people that, you know what, reptiles, snakes, they're great pets. But a lot of people are scared of them or whatnot. But by telling them that they feel like your skin, I've been able to have so many people that had a phobia of reptiles, of snakes, to basically just pet them. And the second that they touch the animal, they understand of how amazing they are. And then they become open-minded and then they work on them. So we can't give up on these scaleless animals. Yes, they are completely different. Yes, they are. Uh, they would not live in nature, but they're definitely really, really great. So all in all, if you are a smaller breeder and you're at home, and I'm telling you on how I'm breeding my animals here, and that when it comes breeding season, um, the, oh, this one's not happy at this point, huh? But like when it comes breeding season and the pheromones are basically in the air and the animals are all enticed into breeding. Now, if you're at home and you have only a few pairs of animals or if you have only one pair of scales, well, it's a much harder thing to do. So what we can do is you can ask friends or pet stores or whatever and try to get some sheds from other males. Now you can take those sheds, you can add those sheds to water and maybe incorporate the smell of another male. So by do building competition between males, so when it comes to breeding, you basically put your male in with the female, you'll spray them with that, what we could say, that shed water, magic formula or, or whatever, yeah, or shed water. Coming down below, a name for that water. <laughs> <laughs> so basically that, that, that water that you've soaked the shed in and you spray the animal in and it'll be like as if you're entering you're putting another male inside with that pair now that can stimulate uh breeding behavior because it's competition so the male will always want to compete and be stronger than the other one and it can stimulate copulations now if ever they're not they're still not interested then you know you gotta you gotta keep at it keep at it, keep, just keep going and keep doing it. And then sometimes, well, there are animals that just don't bond together. These things happen. It's nothing uh, that people that work with lizards are a little bit more used to it. Because for example, I had Fiji Island iguanas. Now Fiji iguanas, they bond together. They'll basically pair up and they pair up for life. Shingleback skinks are known to pair up for life. So if they pair up and they do well, well, that's good. If they don't pair up and they don't do well, they'll never breathe and that's just part of it. So don't give up. It's not because one pair or one little program did not work that the whole project does not work, right? So I mean, because there's a lot of success stories out there and that's where we just want to keep building. So that's basically all I want to talk to you guys. It's all about the Scalers project. It's an awesome project. Um, it works, it does well. Just don't give up. There's a lot of different reasons. Talk to your friends, talk to breeders, ask us questions if you do have questions on why it's not working or if you do have good and successful stories, share them because the more positivity that we share, the better the industry becomes at and grows. So until then, thanks for watching. It's a little bit more of a smaller technical video, but I hope that you can learn something and that if you want to teach me something and I'm definitely your student and I'm here to listen. So thank you again. No stress and we'll talk soon. And you know what guys, breeding season is right around the corner.